Thank you, Kevin. Right, welcome to this meeting of the Stress and Charities Committee. Um, and I welcome all those who've attended online for the subjects and they're appear for. So unfortunately, we don't have the quorum for the committee at this time. Whether people will come, we don't know, but I propose that we start so that we don't hold you up any longer. We will have what is called an informal meeting, but any decisions that we make can then be taken under chair's actions afterwards. Right, so start, as has been said, the chair, I advise that the meeting will be webcast for live or subsequent broadcast. And item two, is there any declarations of interest you wish to raise? Councillor Hussain. And apologies, we've had Councillor Danny Pears and Nigel Oliver. That, that's the only ones we've officially received. Okay. And minutes, we can't actually agree, but is there anything else, anything you wish to bring up under them? No. No. Well. Right. I've had words about the first names, we can do that. Right, so we move on to item five, which is the Cadbury Barn Trust, and I thank Simon and Don who are here. Over to you, who wants to start? Somebody's on. John, are you on mute? Sir? You are, I think if you're talking. Oh, John, I'm, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm mute. Um, thank you, Chair, for inviting us to the meeting. Um, today we've got Simon. Lindford, who's the vice president of the Birmingham School of Bell Ringers, and I'm the chair, John Stewart, I'm the chair of the Cadbury Barn Trust. We've been to the Ch Trust and Charities Committee five times, I think this is our fifth time since 2016, to talk about the developments in uh, Manor Farm Park. Just for um, for those members who might not be aware of, 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 of the developments, and briefly, Manor Farm Park was formerly George Cadbury's estate and he it became he bequeathed it to uh, Birmingham Corporation at the time and it became a public park in 1955. Um, it had uh, it had some historic features such as the Cadbury barn uh, which was sadly burnt down in 2017. It's a, a 20 hectare site in Wheelie Ward in uh, on the Bristol Road. It's because of the way that it was given to the, the city and because of its former history. It's a very, it's a very key part of Birmingham's history, uh, certainly in the south of the city. Um, and since 2011, groups have worked with the city uh, officers and councillors to develop plans for redeveloping the buildings, which are surplus to requirements by the city on that site for use as a community resource. Um, and incidentally, there's no funding from the city required for this. Um, in 2016, it became very clear that uh, the city acting as trustees of the George Cadbury of Public Parks Trust would need to seek a variation in the deeds uh, from the Charity Commission in order to grant any leases that were required in order to carry out, carry out that work. That application was finally made six years later in July 2022 and I understand that there has been a response from the Charity Commission but we don't know what it is formally um, and um, so we are in a position to to build um, or to develop this site but we do need that lease and time is running out for us. In 2020 we were introduced by city city officers and some and the city leader uh, to um, to uh, Simon Linford of the Birmingham School of Bell Ringing, um, who they were interested. And, and uh, Simon's already described some of the the the, the plans previous in, in, before the meeting. But I'll hand over to Simon, who's got some um, further information about the plans. Yes, thank you, John, and thank you, Chair. Yes, um, as John said, I've only been involved in this in the Manor Farm buildings for three years. I'm a I'm a relative lightweight compared with the perseverance of John and his his Cadbury Barn Trust colleagues. Um, we'd previously been trying to find a home for um, 
a secular home for the Birmingham School of Bell Ringing and the, the, the disused buildings in Brandwood End Cemetery, the cemetery chapels. But um, that, that was thwarted by not being able to access the buildings after, after 5 p.m., which is a shame because they continue to deteriorate, I guess. The, and that the, the leader has been quite keen on trying to find a home for uh, the Birmingham School of Bell Ringing, recognising that the bell ringing is little known as being one of the things that, that Birmingham does extremely well. Um, so so we, we found the, the Manor Farm uh, Park buildings and it, it seemed to be the answer to all our, our prayers and the, and a sort of symbiotic relationship with the, the, the Cadbury Barn trustees um, in terms of what they were trying to do because they're quite, quite complementary. Um, but of course, it, uh, for, for the various reasons discussed, we, we haven't got got very far. Now, I wonder if I could just share um, some pictures just to put it into context. It might be helpful for those who are who, who, who are not aware of the, exactly what this site looks like. Um, what, we, what we're talking about here, so the A38 is running down the left hand side of this uh, of this thing and, and the park is off is off to the right. And we're talking about um, uh, the, 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 these are these are existing buildings through the middle at, at the barn uh, right at the front. This is where we're proposing to to put the, the bell ringing training center inside the inside the lodge and the and the cafe. So so that's the that that's the lodge. That's the house. Um, empty houses has been re-roofed um, using funds from the uh, from the insurance payout. Um, and that's the that's a view up the site to to the to the barn and the, um, the the council parks facilities is off to the right there. Now, what what we this is this is a, a, a plan. It's obviously a sketch a sketch plan that that I did showing how uh, with with the park at the top, how the, a couple of pavilion style um, community and cafe building would sit uh, amongst the trees in the, in the top corner of the site. Um, there's possibly a temp temporary cafe um, on part of the car park, losing the, the sort of rather low level shanty style uh, buildings, uh, buildings there, putting some form of interpretation centre into the into the, the, the higher barn building in the middle, having a shared garden and, and a, a revised pedestrian route through to the park, which uh, which avoids using the same pathway as as as, as traffic. And then converting the the lodge building into a, a, a bell ringing training centre, um, and and potentially obviously subject to the, to necessary consents, putting a, a new a tower um, on on the corner to provide a um, an entrance to the park. Um, that's just just a, a couple of pictures of of happy trainee bell ringers, of bell ringers which we, we train a lot of bell ringers in Birmingham. But the, those pictures are at um, St Paul's in the Drury Quarter. Uh, bottom right, I think, is St Lawrence Northfield, and then kids we we teach as well. Um, and and it, it's it's an award winning. The Birmingham School is an award winning uh, thing, and the and the and the pride of the bell ringing community. Um, just an example that you might think that you can't have bells in a in a building like the lodge, but that in the top right, that is a, one of the more successful bell ringing training centres, and that's a that's a repurposed barn building on a on a farm in Scotland, and there are there are three rings of bells in there. There's a ring of 12 bells, there's a ring of eight, there's a there's a silenced ring of eight, there's all sorts of facilities. So it's perfectly possible to do these things in in what look like domestic environments. And and at the bottom, bottom left there, that's the a, a training facility in Worcester Cathedral. Those bells, bells you can see there, they, they are dummies. They're just, um, they've got the right weight, but the bells are not real. And and the um, those bell ringers are, are practicing using using simulated sound and, um, and, and computer uh, technology. Um, and, and then just just looking into the future, and I don't want people to get too too worked up by this. This is just the idea we had of of building a, an iconic um, bell tower, maybe in the future, um, to, to to tag onto the to tag onto the side of the lodge. But that's that's not really part of the, this initial discussion. What we're focusing on initially is just being able to reuse the, the the lodge building there, and potentially this barn, and and have it as part of opening up uh, community uses on the rest of the site. And and in the future, that is thinking back to that plan with the with the two pavilion buildings in the top top left hand corner on the car park. That is the view that we're looking out onto Manor Farm Park, where you 
maybe in a couple of years time would be sitting having a nice cup of coffee. Thanks, Simon. Um, so the, 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 two pro the two projects uh, are complementary. Um, the, the, the trust wishes to do some of that development and uh, to bring in some facilities into the park. Uh, toilets for use by uh, the centre users, um, a, a open space uh, spaces for rent. We we already have a lot of for, a lot of things going on in the park in terms of groups Tai Chi. There are running groups that use the park, um, and we also have a heritage trail in in the park. The the, the problem is, I hope that Rajesh will be able to elucidate this a bit more. Is the delays are causing us real problems. We've been waiting for six years and um, we do need progress on the lease and discussions with the city officers about, about the development of that lease. And for example, we've got funding and planning permission and agreement from many parts of the city to put a welfare unit into the park, but we are unable to complete that because we haven't been, haven't been able to talk to city officers about it. So I think what we've, we've, we've presented a very short paper uh, with a, a number of things that we'd really like the committee to help us with, and that's to develop a plan so that we've got a realistic idea about when we can start to approach funders and 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 um, and designers, um, and um, to facilitate um, the, the the development of the lease. So thank you for your time, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you very much for that. That was a very complete report. Just before I bring Rajesh in, uh, you say you've got funding. Does that include funding for the ongoing maintenance of the property? Um, we have we, there are there are sources of, fun, of funding which which are available. We haven't approached funders uh, because no funders will talk to us unless we've got a, a, the prospect of a lease. And we haven't got a prospect of a lease. So yes, we we would we have already commissioned two business plans uh, for the for the development of the site based on a 25 year lease and um, uh, including including reasonable maintenance and upkeep. Thank you very much, Rajesh. Yeah, I mean. Uh... <clears throat> It is taking a little while. I have been in discussion with the Charity Commission trying to get some progress on um, on a scheme um, subsequent to the consultation we undertook, uh, I think it was last year now. Um, um, and the response was, again, quite non-committal, and they put the responsibility back on the, um, the City Council as trustee, and they wouldn't give us a, a clear indication or a clear steer as to whether they would be prepared to grant us a scheme, um, even though they had all the information relating to the consultation and provided all of that to them, but uh, uh, no firm response was received. Um, the question, I suppose, there's three ways we can deal with this. Uh, first of all, for you, John, um, a short lease um, of the buildings to provide recreation and, uh, sorry, for, um, cafe and refreshment facilities and toilets as part of uh, incidental to the operation of the current park, which should be relatively straightforward. That's one option. The other option, which relates to both the barn and the lodge, um, as I understand it, is that we could lease them on a commercial basis with the proceeds being um, plowed back into the maintenance of the, uh, the park, the trust. And the third option is, the, is to obtain... Um, a scheme from the Charities Commission to change the objects of Cadbury Barn Trust, which obviously uh, moves away from recreational but widens the objects to us educational uh, in relation to the Bar Bar uh, Birmingham School of Bell Rigging. And in relation to uh, the barns themselves, the commercial aspect of it is a bit of an issue. Uh, if you wanted to you know, rent out some of the space, and as we've advised before, um that that has complications in relation to the fact that that that, that isn't actually a charitable activity so we'd need a more formal form of lease in relation to that so there's three aspects it's either a straightforward um short lease to provide cafe facilities refreshment facilities toilet facilities that could be done re relatively quickly that would require a 
resolution of full council to dispose of the building, the barn buildings. Secondly, commercial leases of the barn to the Birmingham School of Bell Ringers or to Cadbury Barn Trust. And the long option, which I can't guarantee will succeed, but obviously uh, we'd do our best to secure it, would be a scheme and possibly carving out the the barn area um, and having a different trust in relation to that and carving out the um, lodge as well. So in effect, they would be taken out of um, the park and operate independently of the park. But obviously we need Charity Commission consent for that. So those are the three options. The other thing I'd, I'd question for you, John, is when you took, if we did take a resolution to um, full council, we'd need to, it'd need to be supported by a full business case as well. Okay. So do do you actually have a fully fully costed business case uh, for those? Well, I mean, obviously, if it's a commercial basis, then we would market it, market the properties on the open market um, for a short lease just for, to provide the cafe and the refreshment. That could be done at less than market value. But if you wanted to proceed with the, um, the, the scheme option, then again, We'd need a full business case, and it would be it would be a, it would be a disposal from a charity to a charity, so that wouldn't be commercial. That wouldn't be on a commercial basis. Okay, uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, can I reply, Chair? Yes, sir. Um, that that would those those options are are, are certainly uh, ways that we consider that we could proceed. I think that I can't. At the moment, we're not in a position to answer the question, which one would you like? Because we need to have a conversation, a discussions about the details and the pros and the cons of each of those and to talk about whatever considerations are going to be in there with the city, with the city council before we can make a decision. So I think that there's a there's a, a scope for a constructive dialogue in order to reach that is re reach your answer to the question, which is which is the the best way of doing it. Um, do we have a business case? Yes, we do have a business case, but the business case, in in its entirety, needs to needs to rest upon what consideration there's going to be between the city council and and um, and uh, the leasors. Which at the moment we we can't we we can't we don't know so we can't put forward a business case. So we're in this kind of circle of we need to have discussions in order to see which is the best option so that we can then put forward a business case. And that's that's where we that's the the sticking point that we've had and we've been trying to unravel that since October last year. So it would be useful to have conversations with the city officers on a semi-formal basis so we could decide which way to proceed because two of those routes seem very attractive to us i don't know about simon um simon do you want to go first because you know probably and i'll respond yes. afterwards so, so when you when you when you're talking about a commercial lease are you talking about a sort of a 25 year lease that, i mean the buildings are are, are fairly wrecked so we're not talking much rent but we're just talking about a 25 year lease at Notional, for notional consideration in return for doing these buildings up and using them for charitable purposes. Can I respond to that, Chair? Yes. Uh, yeah, it'd be commercial, uh, a commercial rent, basically. So that would take into account the condition of the current property uh, and obviously the repairing obligations. We'd have to go out and get an uh, independent valuation. Um, and then, you know, but it would have to be commercial, unfortunately. Those those and then the proceeds would then be be plowed back into the um into the park um which would go somewhere to towards the cost of maintenance which is at the moment covered by the city council so that would be the quickest way of doing it now obviously that depends really on funding really i mean i suppose all of it depends on funding but i don't know what the inside condition of that property is i don't know you know it might take a lot of money it might take a, a, a small amount also there's a, a certain requirements that you have as, as bell ringers that you need to fit it fit out the property in a certain way i don't know what the cost of that is um so 
that's that's the quickest way of doing it. That way we don't have to involve the charity commission. It brings the building back into use. It so that's a plus for the for the for the trust because it's currently sitting vacant. It brings in an income for the trust and it solves a problem for you, albeit there's a financial cost towards that. So I think that's the quickest way of doing it. The scheme proposal, again, it will take time. It needs to be fully costed. We need a full council resolution. Uh, we need a full business case. We need charity commission consent. We probably need to do another consultation. Um, so there's there's a long way to go before we get a scheme from the charity commission. And the charity commission will not give a scheme unless they are pretty certain that's the right thing to do in the circumstance. Bearing in mind is what you're doing is changing the objects of the trust, uh, which they are loath to do because it was gifted for a certain purpose in perpetuity. So rightly, they will ask, why do you want us to do this? What is the purpose? Is it really necessary? If it's necessary, uh, then they'll you know, likely to get, grant us the scheme. So, and that's the same for the barn trust, John. Sure. I mean, commercially, yeah, okay, we can do it on a commercial basis, but again, it's the funding question. Um, I don't know how much the money the trust has at the moment. As I said, the park generates no income and really it washes its face through a subsidy from the city council. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, those are, those, are, those are fair points. Um, as, I, as I said, there is a point in the, the, the project development <clears throat> where you need funding and, a le and the promise of a lease, and the two are intertwined. <laughs> Without one, you can't get the other. So um, I, I th think it's worth exploring those in greater detail with the officers so that we could perhaps come back to the June meeting with a report to say how we'd like to proceed. Yeah, I think that sounds sensible if we can do that. So you've got the three proposals, as you yeah. say, the way you talk about them, say the one's best. But yes. Yeah, I, it might be worth twin tracking that. I don't know. I mean, I, in my view, as if we started with a, a lease of the the barn buildings providing the the welfare facilities and the cafe in the short term with the long-term view to get a scheme into place uh, if the short-term uh, lease was working well and you know was actually you know demonstrating that the scheme can work at that at, at, at a sort of slightly lower level then that would be uh, evidence to present to the charity commission to say well actually this can be broadened into a more uh, substantial uh, operation and justify a scheme being put into place. Yeah. But again, I don't, uh, sorry Chair, but I don't know. You see, my concern is whilst I think from a resident of Birmingham that those buildings need to be put into into some use. And as you say, you know, I think the, the, the committee has previously said they're, 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 they're supportive of it. The sticking point here is going to be the funding unfortunately, because um, it's going to cost a substantial amount of money to bring those buildings back into use. Um, and you can't, you know, we can't really ask the full, we can't ask full council to grant a lease or dispose unless they are cons they are satisfied that, that the, the, the lease is, is viable. Sure. The, 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 the financial basis, you know, the financial um, formula stacks up. Yeah. Uh, I fully agree uh, with you, and um, we've, as I said, we've we've been working on this since 2011 with the city council, and 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 Simon's been doing it since 2020. Um, we've always been we've always been aware that that we need to that we need to have a project that is financially viable and sustainable. Um, and we would, you know, more than happy to discuss those arrangements with you so we can work on the basis of that. But as I've said, there's no point. It's, it's impossible for a voluntary, for a charity to get funding for capital developments and revenue without having a lease or even the promise of a lease. Um, so it's a, it's a good move forward that we've got now the idea that we might be able to get a lease because because then we can secure start to secure funding appropriate funding for it. We've got funding for an interim uh, solution, but I think that I think the discussions to formalise these arrangements would be very very helpful. 
Okay. Thank you for that. I think that's yeah, well, Rajesh, you want to come back? <clears throat> yeah, I mean it's imp just taking this forward though, who's gonna take this forward? Because I, I mean we need we will need some kind of commitment from both sides financial I think financially. Um so I don't know, Chair, who's gonna take this forward because John wants a discussion and I think, you know, and Simon wants a discussion and we can sit down and we can thrash out something, maybe, you know, maybe in the short term, maybe in the long term, maybe we can twin track it so we can get, you know, start on one and then hopefully move on to something bigger in the future. But who's actually going to sit down and talk to John and Simon from the City Council on behalf of the trustee? I mean, I can, I can, you know, provide some legal advice, but, you know, <laughs> I don't have access to any funds or I can't make any decisions personally around how this will be funded. I can't make any commitment to John or Simon on behalf of their, on, the, on behalf of their organisations, on be, you know, on behalf of BCC. So just need to understand who's going to take those discussions forward. We need to work that out. John, you said you need to go back to your committee first anyway. Uh, I, well, I, I need to report back, but the committee has always been aware that the sticking point for the development of the project, and I think I can speak for Simon as well, is, is the granting of a lease. Um, so it should be that we should be able to talk to, perhaps we thought naively, to the city, the city or officers within the city to talk about heads of terms for, for a lease and then into negotiations for a lease. Um, and that's the point that we're at. So um, my, I, I can report back to the committee. We can make a decision on what the pre, what our preferences are. But until we've entered into those discussions, then you know there's there's we cannot make a lot of progress. That's that was the whole purpose of bringing the paper to to the um, to the committee because we're stuck. We're at an impasse. We've got funds. We've got the prospect of funding. We do have some funds. We've got a plan and designs. We just need a lease. I understand that. And as I'm sure you understand, we are in support and we want, some, as Rajesh has said, something to do with the barn. But it's all catch 22. What comes first? Rajesh? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, John, the. Fairview and Property Services is the corporate landlord, so they will yeah. uh, be your first port of call um, in relation to a lease. So are we talking commercial lease here? Well, well uh, I would like to answer your question, but I can't answer the question until we've spoken to the off the officers to see what the costs and of the op uh, of the various uh, options are, which shouldn't be a difficult thing. This is not, you know, uh, I'm sure that the city leases property to third parties every day of the week. So um, we would just like to have an informal conversation uh, between between the three of us, between the city, the Birmingham School of, of Bell Ringy and the Trust, so that we can understand how we can take these buildings off your hands. Uh, so, so I think, uh, uh, yeah. So that leaves <laughs> I mean, I can make you an offer, but I don't know whether it would be of much use. So I think we need a dialogue. I think we need per perhaps with property services. Um, and um, that would be very helpful if we could do that. But I noticed that property services aren't in attendance today. No, no, we're hearing the report first. Right. If we do that, I need to say we hopefully bring something back in June so that we have some kind of movement forward but your first port call is a committee and discussions informal or otherwise with property services with not to suggest to make sure we're on track with the legal side that would be really, agreement with that that would be really helpful thank you very much chair thank you john thank you Simon, for your attendance and hopefully we can have thank some hope thanks very much we won't stay for the rest of the meeting okay. right. thanks, thanks john thanks bye thanks. bye, bye. bye. Right, move on to item six with the Small Heath Park proposed landscape improvements. And um, we have Jonathan Stephen to give you speak to us. Hello there. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a principal landscape architect at the Landscape Practice Group. And I'm also the designer of the proposals for improvements to Small Heath Park. Uh, we have a number, a 
Section 106 agreement for uh, allowing us to improve a uh, leisure area in the Small Heath area, and we have identified Small Heath Park as a suitable site for um, implementing a number of improvements. We've done extensive consultation with the local community and have come up with a number of proposals which were consulted upon. I'll just share my screen to show you those. Um, You see that? Yes. Uh, yeah, so yeah. we have a, a number of uh, proposals uh, that we consulted upon. Uh, rest restoration of an artificial cricket wicket, which was uh, installed several years ago, but has suffered a quite considerable vandalism, unfortunately. Improvements to a multi-use games area. It's quite an old one, and there's a number of uh, fence panels and brickwork that needs repairing. Uh, there's uh, two play areas within the park. Um, one of them sadly has had a large piece of equipment removed from it a few years ago and we were proposing to introduce a new uh, climbing piece of equipment for that play area. The main um focus of this would be a new outdoor gym area which is an intergenerational facility so anyone from young teenagers right through to senior citizens would be able to use that and uh, exercise and work out together um, a number of new seating in and litter bins were proposed for the park including a new family pick picnic area adjacent to the play areas to provide more of a family focus in this area. Uh, biodiversity improvements to the lake, that would include new planting along the lake edge and oxygenation of the lake through fountains and also adjacent to the lake, a wildflower meadow uh, to increase uh, biodiversity and interest and the amount of different types of habitats for wildlife within the park. And finally, uh, one, oh, two more things actually, a, a one kilometer circular walking route that would be marked along this area in purple. And finally, um, the restoration of the Mogul Garden with a new entrance onto Wordsworth Road. Um, that Mogul Garden has sadly been um, closed for a number of years now and has had quite considerable vandalism and we were proposing to improve it and reopen it and provide a new entrance on the park here to help improve site security. We put all these proposals out on Be Heard in December uh, and asked local residents uh, what their views were. Um, we had a lot of negative feedback from the re local residents about the restoration of this garden and reopening of uh, a new entrance on to Wordsworth Road because they felt that this would increase antisocial behaviour in this area and ultimately in, in the grand scheme of things this was the least uh, desirable improvement within the park. The, the top improvements that people wanted to see were the outdoor gym area, uh, new play facility, seating and biodiversity improvements to the lake area and the wildflower uh, meadow. So because the park is within, held within trusts and charities, we need to seek approval from the committee um, in order to progress this scheme. Uh, as soon as we can get that, we can look at finalizing the costs on the most popular and desired items and draft a delegated authority to implement the works hopefully later this year. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Ugood, any questions anybody has? Rajesh. A couple of questions really. Um, if these proposals go ahead, what 
assurances there that there won't be any damage to the equipment and any vandalising of the equipment so that we end up in the same situation as we seem to be at the moment with certain parts of the park and who's going to be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep for these new assets. Okay, I mean, unfortunately, we we can't have any insurances about who has access to it and what damage could potentially be sustained to it. All we can do is uh, propose very robust materials with uh, making sure that whatever we put in is vandal resistant to a certain degree as far as we, we can um, provide. But um, and the only other thing is the more people that are encouraged to use the park and be in the park will reduce um, the vulnerability of those items um, from from being vandalized by people that only would happen if there wasn't many people in the park to, to witness it. So, um, yeah, and in terms of the maintenance, that is all would be covered within the funding. We would have uh, revenue consequences and maintenance to cover any upkeep and maintenance of the new facilities. OK, um, so we can't formally agree the plans being an informal meeting, but we can agree them in principle. And if you need them doing before the next meeting, we'll do it in the chairman's actions. But at this time, thank you for your report. Thank you. Yes, I mean, unfortunately, we have missed the previous one. We were trying to table this for the previous meeting, but uh, I've had a family bereavement, so I've not been around to, to do the, the report. So I'm only just back uh, now to cover this. But we are, I know that the local community is absolutely desperate for us to get on with this. And they they really want to see these improvements as soon as possible. And this is the only thing really holding it up at the moment. What is the total scale? Do you have? Um, if we can get this done, we, we as, soon as, as soon as we seek committee approval and get that approval, we can draft the delegated authority and get this on site by the summer. Right, so hopefully we can get that organised. OK, thank you very much. OK, am I all right to leave now? Thank you, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, thank you for your time. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to the applications for grant funding. And before I start, I will say the one application in the names of Councillor Davis and I has been withdrawn. So we are only discussing the one application from the Fruit of Nut Village, which we had at the last meeting. And there were questions that members wanted to ask. So good idea. Rob, is there anything you'd like to start off by saying? Sorry, did you say Rob? Would you like to introduce your report? Yes, yeah, um, so, sorry, I can't hear that well. Um, so our, our project is uh, about five years old now. Um, we began in Searchley and um, we weren't initially a charity, but we've been a charity for the past few years. And the aim of the charity is that we bring communities together and that we further their knowledge around perennial food growing. So we don't do traditional allotmenty stuff, but what we do do a lot of is um, orchard creation and forest gardens as well. So I have a vision and the vision is that our communities grow and are surrounded by abundant perennial foods. So what the model is and what we've done in Sturchley is we've created 18 spaces. They're not all on council land, but there's, there's quite a few that are, particularly on parks land. Um, they're, they're, all, they're open or they're semi-open, uh, like community buildings or tomorrow we're working at a church, just putting a few trees in with them. And uh, we invite people to join us, meet their neighbours, really, and work together to create these spaces. Uh, the legacy is quite obvious, really, that we're creating, well, it's a perennial landscape, we call it, or edible perennial landscape. So we've got sites now that we've been working on for best, well, more than five years, really. And they've been, uh, they've, they've got quite a good canopy now of walnuts and apple trees and all sorts of things, really. Um, and we've got under them, we plant underneath with bushes, like joster berries, gooseberries, raspberries. And then in amongst that, there's other edible perennials, which if you're not used to the expression, could be all sorts, could be rhubarb, could be herbs, could be some edible flowers. So it looks good, 
it's good for nature and it's just it's, it's a nice meeting space really so that's what we do and we began in Sturchley we've got the 18 sites there we've rolled it out into Druids Heath and to Borsal Heath over the last couple of winters and we've now got about 45 sites so um yeah we've kind of we've made a bit of an impact in these areas made a bit of an impression we brought quite a lot of people together but we did, we see this as the beginning really we think there should be a lot more of it happening so yeah the bid i put in quite a while ago originally i did revise it as well about four or five months ago i think i revised it um and I, look, looking back at it i mean it's it's slightly out of date now because we've done some of the work or the work's moved on a little and our busy period also is the winter so winter for me is like six months of tree planting grafting getting people out there and when they're when they're least likely to want to get involved in the work um propagating plants the summer's a bit calmer so it's a good time to be discussing things like this uh <clears throat> so yeah it, it might it doesn't really need reworking but it needs a little bit of rethink on some elements there's one or two that are exactly as they were you got any questions on that hey, thank you um that makes me look nervous you're saying because it's a lot of money to be asking for and one of the recommendations i was going to put forward is that we pay on invoices rather than actually giving you a sum of money but is there any other questions anybody has uh, yeah, I'd just like to ask uh, Rob, um, so what kind of turnover do you have and where is the funding coming from? Do you have any sort of, where's your funds come from? Do you get other charities to make donations yeah. or is it just... Yeah, the, the, uh, we've had, well, we've, we've actually had quite a lot of different income streams. But none of them have been more than 10,000, I think, is the biggest one we've had. But they've come from about 18 different sources over the last couple of years. And some of it has come from, we've had Neighbourhood Networks money from Hall Green Neighbourhood Networks and from Selly Oak Neighbourhood Network Scheme. We've had recently some money from the um, Birmingham Food Legends and we've had money from the Lottery um, and from Seven Trent Water to work in Druid's Heath and quite a lot of little little bits and pieces as well. So we went to the, char the uh, charity, the Coal Trust, and they gave us money just to buy cages to look after the trees because uh, well, if you look in the budget, a lot of the cost is really making sure the trees survive. So the trees themselves usually work out about £30 and looking after the tree with good posts and good cages near to like £70, £80 for that. So it, it, a diverse uh, stream of income, really. Um, turnover last year, I think, was 33000 but it's higher than that this year already. So we're, we're only in the second year of being a charity at the moment. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm sure you understand that we can't actually agree something today because we are an yeah. informal, we formal. But would you accept that if we I put a recommendation to the next meeting for a discussion to just be academic to say that if you provide invoices for work you've done, we can then reimburse yeah, that, you rather than giving a lump sum. Yeah, yeah, that's not, I mean that's perfectly all right for us, really. I mean, um, as long as we can float the cost of buying trees in sometimes, but uh, we'd have to just work around that really and work out how we were going to do that. But I think we'd be able to manage to do that. Um, the, the big one I see is the it's probably the big one is the cost of trees because the outlay originally would be well, it's not. It's not something we won't be able to cope with, I don't think. We've got a, we've got a total cost of, well, it's only 2,160, so I think we'll be able to manage with that. The trouble is you have to buy it all at once, really. You have to go and go out and buy it all in, order it in September, October time, and then the invoicing wouldn't go through till whenever we did the work, which is most likely January and February next year. This, we really are, we're a winter project, really, so a lot of the work we do is, November, even this starting in December through to the end of March. So that's that's the time scale we're talking about to deliver the work. But invoicing, yeah, I mean that's 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 great, yeah. I can see Rajesh you got your hand up. Yeah, one of the questions I was going to ask, which just you sort of answered, was when do you expect your um, sort of major expenditure? And you've said sometime towards the winter. Yeah. Um, do we just have to? Uh, can we share a breakdown? Does anyone? Who's 
they've got a breakdown of the actual costs, um, the application. So there's a couple of things. What the application? Um, I don't know how to share it. I'm a bit uh, out of touch with this. I haven't done this for for a year. <laughs> Online meetings. Um, I've got it open. Uh, let somewhere. me just double check see if I've got it here. The document. Oh, yeah, I've got. I'll, I'll try and share. I think I've got, got it document. here. Let me just, uh... It's called FNV BMC Costings Version Two. Yes. Um, can no, you see that? Version of the one I had. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that is that the that's the one the last the one I had earlier in this? Yeah, week. it's been bulked up. I can't remember if I did that or not, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So for, for the benefit of uh, the members, there we've got Drew T's Bolton Heath Searchly. Uh, staffing costs and volunteer costs, travel and refreshments. Uh, what, what do you mean by staffing costs? Well, uh, is this, if it's voluntary, why, why would you have staffing costs? Uh, so the, I mean, the model of the project is that somebody delivers, brings people together to deliver these uh, sessions, really. So there's a project officer or a area manager, we call them, who brings people together to do the work, put the bulletin together. Um, maintain contact with people really keep the tool sharp bring it all together on the day uh, okay so so that that's a sort of salary or payment for uh yeah it's a bit like salary yeah work yeah. cost yeah okay so then you've got volunteer cost travel and refreshments that's usually coffee sandwiches yeah on the day yeah um then plants you buy in the plants obviously uh, okay. yeah we buy plants in yeah Cages to protect the plants, uh, yeah. stakes to support the plants, tools and repair, yeah. wood chip, mycorrhiza, is that some kind of fungus? Oh, mycorrhiza, that's, that's only a small cost really, but it's uh, it's basically fungus. We put it in yeah. with the plants' roots when, and that just benefits them when they grow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Get established. yeah, yeah, I've come across that myself when I did a bit of planting. Uh, tree like tree ties pilot. and promotional materials, okay, so it all breaks down, so... So I think that gives a sort of idea of. So would you be purchasing all these all this equipment uh, at the same time? Uh, the idea yeah. Well, well, you have to really to get the the bulk, the bulk yeah. delivery. Um, um, so I, what yeah. I do, I spend the summer working out what we're going to do in the winter. And yeah. Put it all together, a big spreadsheet, and just send it off as early as I can, really, because things run out. So I tried to get that in in August, uh, September at the latest. So if I yeah. know what I'm doing, I can just send off an order to to a company. Well, we sometimes grow our own plants, but um, it's just a, a mix, really, of that. The, 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 some of this work, and I'm, I'm not sure if this if I bought this up or not, but uh, there's more specific details. So the, the Sturchley work, there's a particular project that we've been planning to do in Hazelwell Park to double the size of um, a linear orchard. We've got 40 trees in there. We want to put another 40 in. And then there's the completion of an orchard around the back of the social housing on um, Bealby Road as well. That was the two Sturchy ones. There was another one, but we've partly completed that. So um, there would be possible if we're doing it by invoice, it would just mean maybe we wouldn't do that part of the work because we've actually done some of the planting already. So mm, okay, okay, and obviously the Sturchy operation is a larger operation than the one at Borsleith and Drew. Uh, it's not. It's not large in the sense of sites now, because the Borsley's got as many sites. So, I mean, it pro it's hard to say. When I mean, we've got a bit more energy, a bit more time going to Sturch, we've got a bit more engagement in Sturch, but Borsley has caught up a lot. In, in a short time, it's picked up a lot. We have a WhatsApp group for each area, and the Borsley Heath one's already got more than 100 people on it. So, um, that's happened fairly quickly. And just just out of interest, so Jewish Heath plants 300. How many how many, what type of plants and how many? Uh, looking at fruit trees on this, I think, I think this is all costed at £30. A tree? Tree, I think, yeah. at the moment, yeah. Okay. Okay, so just... Things, but this is about, this bit of, when I put this um, budget together, I did it just on fruit trees. Okay. Okay, well, you, it's helpful, yeah, I think. Something. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Do you provide the ongoing maintenance for the trees? Yeah, well, it's not costing you into that, but that's what we do with other funds, really. This this is a bit like a... Well, I suppose, in a way, there's two projects. There's the project of getting things in the ground, and there's the project of ongoing work. So the, the funding from Selly Out Neighbourhood Networks specifically funds us at the moment to work 
in the forest gardens and bring people together on a weekly basis. So that allows us to do all the maintenance work through the year. And then, but there's not, there's not the money there to do like a bulk planting session or drive the work on a little bit or even complete what we've uh, negotiated that we do in the past. So yeah, that's always the aim is to keep it going. Yeah, Rajesh, I can see your hand. Yeah, and are this, these are, this, this is the total cost for each project for, for this winter, yeah? Uh, <clears throat> this is, so on, on the Sturchley, I've actually got three planting projects there on the other document I thought I'd sent. And the Borsley and the Drews Heath have got one planting day each, but one preparation day each. So it's two days of work on each site in Drews Heath and Borsley. And the Sturchley one's a bit more expensive, I think, because of the, the bigger job with the 40 trees. Yeah. But, but these are the total costs for the project? Uh, for, 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 the three, for, the, for the three projects this this autumn, winter. yeah, yeah, it's the, the whole cost to, to okay. get everything in the ground on these. Well, it's five sites actually, but um, it's three areas. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, if there's no other questions, thank you. So we will put it on for the next meeting just for, because we have to, because we've gone a week now. But thank you very much for your attendance for answering our questions. That was great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank, you. Thank, you. Awesome. thank you very much. I'll disappear then if you don't need me. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jess, for breaking into your holiday. <laughs> uh, can we